Hi everybody, welcome to Seed Survivor. My name is Brent and I work for Agriculture in the Classroom, Saskatchewan. Today, you are going to learn about growing healthy plants and the importance of agriculture. What does a seed need to grow? We're gonna talk about four different things that our seeds need. The first thing is sun and air. What would happen to a plant if you left it in the dark, like under your bed or in a container? It wouldn't grow because plants need sunlight and air for photosynthesis to happen. And we'll talk about photosynthesis a little bit later. The second thing our seeds need is water. What happens to a plant if it's unwatered or overwatered? So if it's underwatered, it will actually dry up. But if it's overwatered, it will drown. Like most things, you need the perfect balance. Not too much water and not too little. The third thing our seeds need is nutrients. So plants need nutrients to grow. Where do nutrients come from? They come from nature. Fertilizer, manure, organic sources, and compost all provide nutrients that our seeds need. And all these things together create healthy soil for our plants to grow in. The last thing we need is healthy soil. But why is soil important to us? We can't live without it. Plants grow in soil and animals feed on these plants and we feed on both animals and plants. Our soil is super, super important. Our soil filters the water to keep it clean. And we can also build on this soil with clay blocks and stones and rocks. Plants growing in soil provide us with the oxygen we need to breathe. You're breathing in the oxygen from plants. Soil also provides shelter for many animals and insects. As crops grow, what is in the soil to keep it healthy? There's worms, there's air, there's water, there's organic material and tons of nutrients. Soil is actually a living ecosystem. It's also important to understand the type of soil in order to know what will grow the best. Soil is made up of three different particles. Sand, silt, and clay. These particles are all different shapes and sizes. Sand is the biggest particle. Think of a basketball. Silt is the medium sized particle. So think of a baseball. And finally, clay is the tiniest of all the particles. So think of a little tiny golf ball. Why does the size of particles matter? Well, if the soil is largely sand, the biggest particle, there will be more space between each particle, so water will flow through really fast and could leave your plant pretty thirsty. But if the soil is mostly clay, the particles are really close together and then the water won't be able to flow through it as well, which can deprive a plant's roots of air and even drown your plants. Healthy soil or ideal crop soil we call loam. Loam is generally dark brown, earthy smelling, and a mix of different particles and sizes, and a lot of organic material in there. Now that we are experts on what a seed needs to grow, sun, air, water, healthy soil and nutrients, it's time to grow your very own sunflower microgreens. Cool. The first thing you're gonna need is a seed survivor cup or any small container you have at home, about 12 ounces. And we need to fill it about three quarters full of nutrient rich soil. So you wanna fill it up about three quarters full. Just like that. Now the next thing you're gonna need is 10 sunflower microgreens. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. What we're also gonna need is our lid and a soup spoon for our water later. What you're gonna to wanna to do is take each seed and press it gently down into the soil. Make sure that you're giving your seeds enough room around them for their roots to grow. So we're gonna spread all 10 of these 
around in our soil and pressing them just gently into the soil. Eight, nine, and finally, 10. So you should have all 10 of your seeds in there. If you're planning on transporting your cup from school or home, you can use a lid to keep the contents inside the cup so you don't make a mess. But the second you get home, you wanna take that lid off so your seeds have lots and lots of room to grow. Make sure to recycle the lid as well. So we have our soil, we have our nutrients, and we have our seeds. What else do we need? Absolutely, we need water. At home, you can take one big tablespoon like this, and you're gonna to wanna to put one tablespoon of water every single morning. Now, the first time you do this, you might have to put a little bit extra. You don't wanna to put too much because you might drown your seeds, but you wanna put just enough that your soil feels like a wet sponge so that your seeds have lots of water. Once you're done watering, you wanna put your cup in a sunny window. Remember, sunflower microgreens love the sun. Sunflower microgreens are intended to be harvested when the first leaf pair or seed leaf opens fully and turns green. This is the point at which your microgreens will be the richest in nutrients and it'll be about one week after they're planted. To harvest your microgreens, either pinch off the microgreen above the soil with clean fingers, scissors, or enjoy whole, roots and all. Simply rinse the soil from your microgreens and enjoy. Sunflower microgreens are great on their own, in salads, or even on a sandwich. The contents of the cup can also be composted, and the Seed Survivor cup can be washed and reused. You may be wondering, why are we planting sunflower microgreens instead of large, gigantic sunflowers like we normally do with Seed Survivor? Well, as we head into the colder months, it is too cold outside for your sunflowers to survive and keep growing in the garden. Now let's talk about nutrients. A plant requires 17 different nutrients, but the main nutrients all plants need for healthy growth are N, nitrogen, P for phosphorus, and K for potassium. We can grow more plants in the same piece of land if we use the four R's. We need the right nutrients at the right time of year in the right amount, so not too much and not too little, and in the right place, right near our seeds. By giving the plant exactly what it needs to eat and when it needs it, it will produce much, much more food. So first, we're gonna talk about nitrogen. And when you hear nitrogen, I want you to think of the muscles of the fertilizers. So hold up your arms and show everyone your muscles, because nitrogen helps plants stay green, healthy, and strong. Nitrogen helps the plants we eat become good for us by adding proteins we need to grow and be strong. So where do you think nitrogen comes from? Here's a clue. Congratulations, you just took a deep breath of fresh nitrogen. That's right. In the air we breathe, 78% of it is nitrogen. <sighs> now, you may wonder, if there's so much nitrogen in the air, why do we need to produce nitrogen fertilizers? Well, the funny thing about nitrogen is, plants can't really use it in the air form. Only legumes like soybeans and alfalfa can draw nitrogen directly from the air. They work with bacteria living in the soil to transform nitrogen in the air to a form that can be used by plants. We call this nitrogen fixing. Other crops need to have nitrogen delivered in a digestible form. That's where fertilizers come in. Fertilizer companies take nitrogen from the air and mix it with natural gas through a unique and complex process to form the base of all nitrogen fertilizers. 
Next, we're gonna talk about phosphorus or P. When you think about phosphorus, I want you to reach out and try to grab at the energy. That is what phosphorus is doing for these plants. It helps a plant to use the sun's energy to make food through photosynthesis. We get both nutrients and energy from the foods we eat, but it doesn't exactly work that way with plants. They require both nutrients from the soil and energy from the sun. Plants also need phosphorus to grow healthy root systems. Where do you think phosphorus comes from? Here's a clue. It comes directly from nature too. Phosphate is nothing more than fossilized sea creatures, mined from rock deposits in the earth. We could even call it fish fossils. North Carolina, Florida, Idaho, and Tennessee are the most common North American places that we have phosphate rock. But not all these places are known for finding fossils. Can you guess what sea creature made this fossil found in one of Nutrient's phosphate mines? This fossil is a jaw fossil from an extinct shark that lived about 250 to 270 million years ago called Helicoprion. No one knows for sure, but artists have drawn what they think it would look like. Do you know what one of the most common byproducts is of the phosphate mining process? Shark teeth. Finally, we are gonna talk about potassium, or K. Potassium is like the boxer of the fertilizers for the plant. So everyone take your hand and punch out like this, like you're a boxer. So potassium is called the protector. Potassium protects our plants against diseases and help them stay healthy when it is cold or dry. It also helps plants move nutrients and water in the stem so the plant doesn't wilt. Where do you think potassium comes from? It's mined from evaporated oceans. Potash is also called potassium chloride. And potash really doesn't change from the time it's mined 3,000 feet below the surface. So think about where you're sitting right now. 3,000 feet below us, potash is being mined. That's nearly one kilometer or over half a mile. So instead of making potash, it's pulled out of the ground washed and resized into granules that farmers spread on their fields. Do you know where the most significant potash deposits in the whole world are found? I'll give you a clue. It's where I am right now. Yes, Saskatchewan, Canada. This apple represents the whole surface of our world. How much of the Earth's surface do you think is devoted to growing the food we eat every single day? If you look at a globe, what is the main color you see? That's right, blue. About 70% of our planet is covered in water. What do you see in this picture? Land such as deserts, mountain, tundras, swamps. Those are all not good places to grow food. This next session has to be removed because of cities. We can't grow very good crops in cities and some land is too rocky, wet, or hot. This is the last section. This tiny peel on our land is about 10% of the Earth's land and that is where we can grow our food. This amount of soil is never ever going to get any bigger. In fact, it might even get smaller as our cities expand and land uses change. Farmers are stewards of the land and with technology, innovation, and best practices, they've been able to grow food on nearly 40% of the land. Wow. For example, land that was too wet, like in India, we started growing crops like rice that could grow well in that climate. One in eight Canadians or one in seven Americans work in agriculture every single day to help feed our world. We should thank them for the food in our bellies and the clothes on our backs. I'm going to leave you with something to think about. Farmers use science 
technology, and best management practices to feed our growing population in a way that protects the environment. But it is up to all of us to do our part to care for the land, air, and also our water. How do you care for the environment, or what could you do to reduce your environmental footprint? Here are some examples. You could reduce, reuse, recycle, compost, pick up litter, or even don't waste your food or water. Please go to www.seedsurvivor.com to play fun games about what plants need to grow, for growing advice on your very own sunflowers, recipes, videos, teacher resources, and so much more. Have fun watching your sunflowers grow. See you later.